Praise the Lord. Good morning. It's good to see you. Where is Christian Orbach? Stand just for a moment, sir. Christian achieved his Eagle Scout status yesterday. Had a ceremony for that. So Y'all give him a praise the Lord for that. That's, a, that's quite an accomplishment. You may be seated now. Don't get, let it go to your head. <laughs> At least for maybe a day. <laughs> that is an achievement. We're very proud of you, son. God bless you. We're considering, uh, continuing our series in Extraordinary Living. So uh, get your Bible out. Open it to Philippians chapter 2. Uh, we've said over and over again through this series that this whole book is about this different kind of life that Christians have been called to. Of course, the whole Bible is a description and, a, and the pathway as, as well as the promise to be able to, to live a different kind of life. If any man's in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things pass away, all things become new. The life that God has called the Christian to live and has given us the capacity to live, it really is a supernatural life. It is an extraordinary life. It's beyond the ordinary. And really, you could say if it's beyond the extraordinary, it's a supernatural life. The only way to live this life is through Christ and by his grace and through his promises. So as we look at this letter, just a couple of things by way of catching us up to part four where we are in Philippians chapter two today. We started in chapter one, we're pretty much in a simple phrase, deals with the issue. If we're gonna live this extraordinary life, then it has to do with a, a mind that is single-minded. Having a heart, having a mind that's set on Christ, upon his will, upon his purpose, really just on his, his, your personal relationship with him. Uh, and Paul in chapter one of Philippians deals with the issues of where he is, the circumstances, dealing with the critics he's been facing, the problems that he's dealing with. All of this has to do with victory in the midst of all those kind of things. Victory in the midst of your biggest critics, victory in the midst of your worst circumstances. All of it's taking place around him. Yet he says, you know, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And then he goes on to rejoice. He starts praising the Lord about all that God's doing as a result of him being in Rome as a prisoner. Most of us look at that and we wouldn't be excited about that at all. But here he is praising God for the circumstances that he's in and how that has fallen out for a greater opportunity to preach the gospel. In chapter two, we started with in uh, last week, we get to deal with the, not just the single mindedness of, extraordin of the extraordinary life, but the submissive minded person, the person who comes to realization of humility and realizes that he, we're here for ultimately for the Lord and we're here for others. We're not here for ourselves. We talked about the little common acrostic that's used at least I've heard most of my Christian life that joy is Jesus, others, and you. But we discussed last week, it's really just Jesus and others. That you really, you know, that, of course, that's just the opposite of what's being preached in a lot of churches today, where you become the center of attention. It's Jesus and others. And the secret of understanding the joy of the extraordinary life is when you're just taken out of the picture, you're here to serve, you're here for Christ, you're here for the glory of God. And what happens though, you reap what you sow. You benefit. There's a blessing that flows your way. There's grace that comes your direction. There's promises from God that are fulfilled in your life that wouldn't otherwise be fulfilled if you were making it really about you. So as he gets in talking about the submissive mind and he talks about the servant's mind where he says in the first part of chapter two, hey, it's, it, hey, don't do anything out of vain glory. Just being recognized of men. Don't do anything from empty, selfish conceit. And he's dealing with an issue, you know, you've got to take yourself out of the picture here. You know, so, so remove that element of it and, and always get back to what it's all about. And then, you know, he's, he's obviously he's, his whole life is a demonstration of everything he's preached. He is walking what he's talking. But then in, in chapter two, where we're going to look at today, he lifts up two great examples of everything he's just said. All this single mindedness, all this servanthood, all this submissive mind, all this, 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 this heart that's set on uh, honoring Christ with your life and letting the message of the gospel flow from your life. He, he lists up two great examples. And we'll look at those this morning. So in Philippians chapter two, we'll start with verse 19. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. For they all seek after their own interest and not those of Christ Jesus. Well, that's a powerful statement, isn't it? I mean, Paul has reached thousands upon tens of thousands of people. 
Multiple churches have been established in the major metropolitan areas of, of this part of e Europe and uh, Eastern Europe. I, and the gospel's gone out. And as he looks across all those churches and all those people he knows, he said, hey, by the way, there, you know, uh, there's this one guy, Timothy. He's genuinely concerned about you. He doesn't look after his own interest. He's concerned about everything he's just said, we've read about in chapters two, one through 18, we looked at last week. Now you see this great illustration of it. He says, you know, but you know of his proven worth, that he served me, he has served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. Therefore, I hope to send him immediately as soon as I see how things go with me. What's he saying? Uh, if I have to stay in jail, <laughs> I'm sending Timothy. If I get crucified like Jesus, I'll send Timothy. Now, if things go different with me, well, that's where he said, you know, then, then I'll come with him. Verse 25, but, but I thought it necessary to send you Aphrodite. Now, here's another guy he brings into the picture here. My brother, my fellow worker, my fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need. Because he was longing for you all. He was distressed because you'd heard that he was sick. Or indeed, he was sick to the point of death. But God had mercy upon him, and not on him only, but also on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I have sent him all the more eagerly in order that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less concerned about you. Therefore, receive him in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in high regard because he has come close to death for the work of Christ, risking his own life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. Well, this is a great testimony he's giving of two men here, of Timothy and of Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus was a minister in Philippi. He has left Philippi with a gift, and he's come to spend time in prison, not just as a visitor, He's given the lot to come in and, and stay with the apostle while he's in prison. So he's left the convenience of home, gone to jail in a prison ministry that's quite different from the day's prison ministries. And he's gone with this gift from the Philippians and he's also gone as a minister. And, and I just love the way this, this letter works again. This is a letter not of rebuke. This is not a letter of, of necessarily doctrinal correction. He's talking about this ex, his, two things really. His expression of gratitude for the church, how he loves them, how he thanks them for sending Epaphroditus with his gift and to minister to him. And so it's all wrapped up in uh, really it, it's a love letter. Then the last chapter, he deals with the second reason for his writing. And you have to wait a couple Sundays till we get to the last chapter. All right. And we'll deal with that. So maybe we'll do a preview at the end of the sermon like they do with TV shows. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> but anyway, he's, he's, he's lifting up two great examples of everything that he's just laid out about the extraordinary life of, of being filled with Jesus and being used by Jesus and letting God do something real in your heart and life. In fact, I, I was looking for kind of a subtitle here. You could call it Marks of the Genuine of genuine Faithfulness or Marks of a Faithful Believer. And he, he lifts up these two guys as an illustration of what faithfulness really is all about. Well, that, that is certainly a word and a term that's been lost in the culture that we live in. We don't know a lot about faithfulness. That till death do us part doesn't, doesn't carry like it used to carry in the world that we used to live in. But here's two guys that stand out like beacons. I mean, they're like spotlights in, in the dark night as Paul raises them up and, and presents them to the church. And one they know of, in fact, really they know of both. They're familiar with Timothy. In fact, if you go back and you look in, in Acts, you'll see in, in Acts chapter 16, chapter 14, I believe, chapter four as well. There's a lot of passages there where it talks about Paul and Timothy being in Philippi. So he's not a stranger to them any more than Paul is. He's been with Paul the whole time as he talks to them. He says, now I'm going to send Timothy to you. So let's look at these two men today and see how, how the apostle describes these guys and maybe hopefully be encouraged to the point where we say, hey, that's, what, that's the kind of person I, I want to be in my spiritual life. He said, there's Timothy. And he says, I'm going to send Timothy and he's going to bring me a report. Now, how does he know Timothy's going to do that? What keeps Timothy from just saying, I'm going to go to Philippi and I'm not coming back. <laughs> I'm going to just stay at Philippi or I'm going to go somewhere else or I'm done with this. It's time for a vacation. You know, I'm just tired of the ministry or whatever it might be. 
He has a confidence in this guy. You know why he calls him? He has a kindred spirit. So there's nobody like him. He has a kindred spirit. L literally, it means that there's no one else of equal soul. He shares my heart for you. He shares my heart for God. He shares my heart for the word of God. There's nobody like this guy. It, it, you know, I know who I am in Christ and I know who he is in Christ. This guy's genuine and he's real and he's just he's laying it out here. He says, you know, there's nobody like him. There's not, there's not another person around like him. In fact, he lists several things about him. He says he is genuinely concerned for you. Well, I tell you, we're living in a, in a time when it's politically, you know, correct to share with one another, hey, I love you or I care about you. Or, and we express some concern. Sometimes that may be because, you know, we want to get along with people and want to act like we really care about them at different times when we can really be self-absorbed. But not so with Timothy. There's no self-absorption here. He really cares. And he's shown that he really cares. I mean, he, he, he's still with Paul while he's in prison. All right. So the, here's a guy. He says you can trust him because he really does care about you. And he lays it out in verse 20. He said there's, there's nobody cares about like you like he does. He knows them. They know him. There's a there's a mutual relationship. But not only that, he says not only is he genuinely concerned for you. He said he's concerned for the interest of Christ. By the way, that's what gives him a real concern for them. Because he's concerned for them, not what he can get out of them or what they can give to him or how they can advance him, which a lot of concern in our culture is today. What's in it for me? Is this going to help me advance my life, my situation, my welfare or my job opportunity? So I'm going to express real concern. For, no, this is a genuine, heartfelt, transparent concern. And it's based upon first and foremost, he's concerned about the interest of Christ. And let me say, just as a little footnote here, you are the interest of Christ. <laughs> the Philippians were the interest of Christ. People, saved people, are the interest of Christ. As well as lost people are the interest of Christ. One thing you see clearly throughout scriptures, from the creation to the ultimate fulfillment of all that God's promised through the end of time is God loves people. God loves you. God's concerned about you. And if anybody it really knows what it means to really be concerned about Christ's interest, then they love you. Amen. They love people. They love lost people. And this is the heart of Timothy. This is, this is his, whole, his whole heart. You know, and, and Timothy's a, a unique guy. He's come up with some, some godly heritage. His mother is, is, is probably Jewish. His, his father's Gentile. So, uh, you know, here's a guy who, who's, who's kind of been in both worlds. But now he's come to Christ and now God's doing something really supernatural. And, and it's so interesting the way Paul works because being a Jew, he understands the heart of Paul, but also coming from Gentile blood and Gentile world, he understands that world as well. Paul's being called to the Gentiles. So, you know, the sovereignty of God is so unique. But I don't think that God is any less sovereign in the apostle Paul's life than he is in your life. I believe you are where you are by reason. I believe you associate in the circles you associate because God put you there. I believe you have the job you have because God's got you there for a reason, all right? I believe that you're, you're in the community. I believe you're, man, I believe God is so sovereign. You're in the church you're in because God wants you here. And we get serious about it. You know, I just can't decide where I want to go. I decide where God wants me to go. And so here he is. He said, you know, he's concerned about you. He's concerned about the interest of Christ. And then I just, man, I, I love the way he kind of puts a, a, another little whipped cream or cherry on the top of this. You know, he, he's, he's proven himself. He's not, he's not a, you know, a fly by night kind of guy. He's proven himself. He's not up one day and out the next, in and back and forth. His, his, his walk isn't so unstable that, you, you know, you can't count on him. This guy's, a, he's the real deal. And he's proven himself. All right? he said, I know this guy. I know who he is. Now, by the way, it's, we want that set of us, hopefully, that we kind of, have that kind of integrity and that kind of character. But you know, that didn't come overnight. This is after years, all right? Timothy's had to grow up a lot. Timothy's had probably some failures in his life. Timothy's had some, some immaturity to deal with. And Paul says, now this guy says, hey, his, his proven character is that word dokimos. The, the Iwana people should be familiar with that word because about a, talks about a, a faithful and a proven servant needs not to be ashamed. This is that whole idea here of the proven servant. You know, somebody that doesn't need to be ashamed. 
They've, they've stood the test. They've been in the fire. They didn't bail out. They didn't quit. They didn't give up. They stayed true to the course. And if there was failure, they went straight to the cross, got it right with God and started moving forward. So I know this guy. He has, a, he has proven himself. Now, put it, let me put it in some understandable terms. I won't put it on the overhead, but there's three things he comes out of this. One, he loves God's people. He loves people in general. Two, he loves God's son. The third part is brought about in this thing when he says he's, he's like a, a faithful son to me. He loves God's leaders. He's like a faithful son to me. And he ministers to my need. Now, I, I've met a lot of people over the years who said, you know, I feel like God wants to use me. I feel like I need to have this ministry. I feel like I'm called to this. If that's true, then you need to just kind of capture everything that he's saying here. Because here's a guy who's being sent on mission. Here's a guy who's been given a task. Here's a guy who's been given a godly responsibility to fulfill. And what got him to the page where Paul says, not only are you a candidate, you're a worthy candidate. You're the guy we're going to send. I think it boils back to this. He cares about people. He cares about God's interest in you. He's concerned about you more than he's concerned about himself. If you go back to the first of chapter two, remember, where it talks about doing nothing from vain glory, empty conceit or selfishness. This is the guy. This is, the guy. this is the guy I want my, to be my friend. How about you? If you have a friend like this, you better thank God. Because <laughs> they're rare indeed. This guy's not behind the scenes when people come up to talk about Paul to Timothy. And you know there are a lot of people talking about Paul. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's obvious and as you know, the platform he had, there was a, a lot of people who didn't like Paul. There's a lot of people who hated Paul. A lot of people disagreed with Paul. There were Jews and Gentiles as well that were out for Paul. You know, I'm sure when Paul got to town, there's people staying on the edge of the sentence with signs, you know, down with Paul. <laughs> we don't like Paul's politics or we don't like Paul's this, you know. There's somebody out there protesting. But if you went to Timothy by himself and said, let me tell you something about Paul. I think Timothy would stop you right there. He said, let me tell you something about Paul. He's a man of God. If you got something other report than that, I'm not interested in hearing it. I'm not interested in hearing it. He says, he's going to go and he's going to bring back the right report. So here's a guy who has integrity, he has character, he loves God, he loves God's people, he loves God's son, and he loves God's servants, and he loves God's leaders. He's, he's, he's with him. And I think that if we want to be counted worthy of a task, worthy of ministry, this is the kind of spirit we have to embrace. Genuine, and let me use the word again, faithfulness. Faithfulness, commitment, Lord. And then that's, and Paul says, I'm sending him to you. He said, by the way, I'm sending back somebody to you that you sent to me to give you a report of what's going on. Epaphroditus. A lot of early theologians believe that Epaphroditus was a pastor there in the church at Philippi. And taken upon this responsibility as part of his ministry to go and, and tend to the needs of the apostle Paul and to take him a gift and, to, and to, to give those things to him. But while they're ministered to him at the same time. And he, he describes Epaphroditus in, in three different ways. When he talks about it, he says, and let me, I'm going to send Epaphroditus to you, my brother, my fellow worker, my fellow soldier. And now, he says two more words. He said, messenger and minister. Now, that was the reason that the church of Philippi sent him to Paul. He's a messenger for them and a minister to him. You go to Paul, you give him this thing that we're going to send you with, and then you minister to his need, and you tell him this. Faithful to carry out the message he'd be in. Faithful, you know, he didn't start back and say, now hold, 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 hold on a second. Let, let, me, let me reconsider. How much is this paying? And <clears throat> you do realize that if I go see Paul, I have to go to jail. Do not pass go collect $200 thing. You know, there's no benefit in it for me to go see Paul. So what do I get out of the deal? Paul's in prison. I'm going to have to go to prison. And the common theme of the day, if they would allow people to come and stay with Paul in jail. Now that's, you know, that's not, that's not the Hampton Suites, much less Motel 6. Amen. It's not a nice place to stay. It's not, you know, we want to go into the description for now. But I'll say that this was, this was a commitment. This was a sacrifice to leave. And by the way, where is he going? He's going to Rome. Rome has started killing Christians. This is where it all starts beginning. 
You know, there's a possibility of losing his life. Possibility of, if they send his Paul to death and find him treasonous and that his doctrine is dangerous and they decide to kill him, then Timothy could be killed and also Epaphroditus could be killed. This is, you know, guilt by association. He didn't back off. Got to love this. Three things. That, I think I've shared these, these three points in a much larger detail at one of our men's retreats or something, but he calls him my brother. He's my, no, he's not of the same mother or another brother from another mother or whatever it might be. But he's his brother and he's talking about the spiritual bond in the family of Christ. He's talking about that brotherhood that is more unique than any fleshly brotherhood could ever be. It is the highest order of brotherhood. If you're a brother in this hood, then you're in the right hood. It's the proper brotherhood. If you're a sister who lives in that hood, you're in the right place. There's not a higher ranking place, not a better fraternity, not a greater order than this family called the family of God. It beats the Juanas, the Rotaries, all the other little things that are floating around out there. All right? This is, this is, it doesn't get better than being in the family of God. And once you are introduced as a, and born into this family through rebirth in Christ Jesus, then you have a place in the family, your brother and your sister. But obviously Epaphroditus, he's showing the true brother qualities, you know. Not as he just a redeemed brother in Christ, children of God in Christ, and dwelt by the same Holy Spirit, under the same blood of Jesus Christ, the greatest brotherhood in the world, but he's acting like a brother. Amen. He's caring for him like a brother. He's committed to him like a brother. It deals with a, a common sympathy, with common interest. He uses the word fellowship many times. But not only <coughs> is he my brother, the second thing he talks about him is this fellow worker. In verse 25, he refers to him in this regard. The interesting thing about this, <coughs> we talked about being taken care of. It's the word, we get our word for liturgy from. The Greek word liturgion has to do with priestly service. He says, Epaphroditus has shown up here like a priest for me. Now, in the order of the Old Testament, priest priest would stand before God on behalf of the people. All right? To confess their sins, to offer sacrifice, to carry on worship. But he would also stand before the people on behalf of God. And he says, this is Epaphroditus. He's the kind of guy who stands before God, finds out what I need, <laughs> and ministers it to me. And then he stands before me to find out what my need and takes it to the Father. And is available to carry out any service that he can so that the needs are met and things are taken care of. He's a fellow worker. I love the word work here. It's that same word we get from the, our word energy from that, the word for, you know, an application of physical doing of stuff. It's involvement. It's commitment. It's sacrifice. He's not sitting on his hands, all right? He's not sitting in the pew and just watching what goes on or just saying, oh, I'll pray for you or I'll put you on my prayer list. He's a guy committed to do something. There's too many people in our churches today who are content to be that kind of way. They're believers, but they're not workers. And I'm not just talking about working at the church. Lord knows we always need workers at the church. But I'm talking about workers in life. Workers in the kingdom. Realizing that the job that I have is my ministry. I have a ministry there and I'm there for God's glory and I'm there for the kingdom and I'm there to, to be God's priest in that place. That the home I live in there, I'm there for the glory of God. I, that's part of my work and my ministry is my home, my wife, my husband, whatever it might be, your children, your parents, you're there is in ministry context. It's not just about what you can get and what people can give to you and how you can be blessed and how you can like or dislike or, you know, whatever it might be. We have far too many lazy visionaries. Amen. You know, they're talking about God is going to do this in my life and I want God to do this in my life and God to do that. I have a promise from God. And God but you just sit around all day long. Yeah. Yeah. You don't pray, you don't pursue, you don't commit. There's no zeal. There's no fire, there's no passion. It's kind of pious. We call them believers, God call them pious make-believers. Amen. You know, there's, it's one thing to come here and worship, 
But we don't just worship, we also witness. It's one thing to hear and worship, but we also commit, we serve, we sacrifice, whatever it might be. It's a spiritual work. It starts with living the right kind of life. Honoring the Lord Jesus with your life. But it's a spiritual work. And if, it's, if it is a spiritual work, let me say this. It has to be done by spiritual people. Because it, is a spirit, it has to be done in a spiritual way. Seeking God's grace, his leadership, his strength, his mercy. To be filled with the spirit. To be filled with the spirit. And that creates a personality or an attitude about you that's unique. That makes you, I believe, attractive to other people. I want to be around that person. I, I, want to, I, want to, I want to talk to that person. I want to spend time with that person. I, I, I like to fellowship with that person. Why? Because God's doing something there. You say, I, I, I need some of that on me. You know, I need to be around that. Because that, it blesses you. And there's always those in the church that say, well, you know, they're really a nice person, but, you know, they're kind of, a, they're fine Christian, but man, nobody can be around them. Nobody wants to work with them. I mean, it's like you look at a porcupine, they're real cute until you touch one. <laughs> Christians like that in the church, amen? They're real cute until you get around close to them. And they got that sticky, opinionated, you know, self-centered, you know. They can't develop comradeship. It, it's too often sitting in the, in the place of judge. I'm spiritual. Let me help you. But don't help me. I need no help. I've arrived. You can call me Mr. Here. <laughs> Whatever it might be. We've all, we've, we've all seen, probably most of us have demonstrated at some point in time in our life. Amen? And if you're there now, then move away because, as, you know, you say, oh, nobody wants to be friends with me. Maybe there's a reason. <laughs> Maybe there's a reason. And it would do... Do a great service to yourself to spend a little time with God about this issue, issue. The Bible says if you want friends, you must first show yourself friendly. <laughs> I think that Jesus put it most appropriately. He says, you reap what you sow. Be a friend. Love people. Commit to people. Serve people. Help people. Look beyond yourself. See what God wants to do. He says, Epaphroditus, he's a fellow worker. He doesn't sit back, lean against the rock wall and say, well, you know Timothy's here. He's better at it. Let me do it. But not only is he a fellow worker, catch this third point, he's a fellow soldier. This really lays it out for me. Because we are in a war. And somewhere down the line, we have to come up with a warrior's mentality. Because the battle line's been drawn. And the forces of evil know exactly where the battle line is drawn and they are advancing every day, doing everything they can. Every time Satan sees you, he, he, he doesn't see how handsome you or beautiful you are. He doesn't say, oh, he's a fine guy, I'll leave him alone today. He's a good old boy, you know, he's gonna make it. You know, he looks at you with pure hatred. He looks at your family with pure disdain. He despises you. He is doing everything he can along with his little minions to destroy you, ruin your life, ruin your family, wreck your job, wreck your career, ruin everything about you, keep you away from God, keep you distracted, keep you tied up. Doesn't want you getting near God and the will of God for your life. He hates you. I think it's where David comes back and David says, Lord, I hate him with a perfect hatred. It's a righteousness. Because he opposes you in everything you're for, I oppose him. Because he resists you and all that you are, I resist him. I take up my weapons against him and I take up my, my armor against him and I choose to stand with the other soldiers of the kingdom army and be what God's called us to be. And nothing makes further advancements on the battlefield than people who love Jesus and are filled with him and love his word and spend time with him. Fully prepared for the battle. Worst thing you can do is play into his hand. Worst thing you can do is, is, is sympathize with him. Worst thing you can do is, is, is just get discouraged even and lay down your sword and your shield. Say, oh, it's just hard, man. It's just hard. I can't do this anymore. Have you ever felt that way? I have. I have lots of times. I have this week. <laughs> In fact, it was yesterday I think I was feeling that way. <laughs> you say, oh, man. It's a resting point. It's a struggle. No, 
You realize you're in a war. You know, to retreat is to surrender. You keep moving forward. You keep trusting. And this, he said, this is Epaphroditus. You know, he, he's like a soldier with me. He's standing on the front line. We're in Rome in the heat of the battle. And here he is with me. You sent him. Good for you. Praise God. I'm sending it back to you. In fact, he talks about him here. It's interesting when he, when, when he talks about him in verse 25. He says, listen, I'm, I'm sending back Epaphrodite. He's my brother, my fellow worker, my soldier. But he's also your messenger and minister to my need. He was longing for you all. He's getting homesick. All right. They were longing for him. He's, one, he's the pastor. But he goes on to say, but he was distressed for you. Why? Because you heard he was sick. What? Excuse me? <laughs> I thought he's supposed to be distressed because he's sick. <laughs> he's distressed for you because you heard he was sick. He didn't want you to be bothered by something else. He didn't want you to, to be concerned about him. And Paul said, hey, you, were, you, know, you, you should be praying for the guy because he was sick and he almost died. But God had mercy on him. But he's here. He says, he risked I think one translation says he hazarded his life. From the Greek, you could really change it to, to modern English. Would be this: He gambled with his life by coming here. You know, everybody's talking, bola, 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 all this bola talk. You know, this is like saying, you know, and, and there are people who do this today who are in the heart of a bola country and they're there for the gospel's sake. They're the Epaphroditus of the day. They're saying, oh, I'm getting out of here, man. I got sickness and disease. And I'll let you know, many times our mission boards, they go to these missionaries and say, come home, get out of there now. And many do, but many don't. They stick it out. They risk their lives. We, we, we can't qualify for this, this, this part here if we want to risk our reputation. We're afraid what people would think about us, what someone might say about us. That's, you know, a warrior puts on a uniform that identifies him and marks him for the enemy. A warrior runs up a flag which he stands under and fights. We know who we are. We stand where we stand because we belong who we belong to. We don't back up, amen? So watch it if you get in that place where as Paul was dealing with the Romans and when he writes to them, he said, listen, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's God's power and salvation to everybody who believes. Hey, put the flag up. I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. You don't walk in the room and say, well, I hope nobody finds out I'm a Christian. Well, you probably aren't, so don't worry about it. Did I just say that? <laughs> yes, I did. There'll be no apologies. He said, listen, he loves you. You love him. He tried to conceal his own suffering. You know, he, 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 he's full of heaviness. He didn't want you to be full of heaviness. That, by the way, that word means to be worn out and overpowered with heavy grief. Worn out. Verse 30, he risked his life. Two great pictures, two great portraits of two men. Three, really, when you look at Paul as well. Amen. A trio of examples. Every one of you who truly know the Lord Jesus Christ, there's something in you in this very moment that I speak these words as in. That's where I want to be. That's what I want to be. That's the testimony I want. That's the life I want to live. When I'm gone, I want that on my epitaph. Brother, worker, soldier. Amen. Isn't it? That's just something about the true believer that wants that. At the same time, if we're not moving in that direction, there's something, it almost feels like guilt, but no. It's not guilt, it's conviction. Amen. The Holy Spirit's dealing with you. Say, okay, move to that. That's the noble. That's the noble path. Move towards that. Surrender to Christ and his lordship. Surrender to the Holy Spirit, filling your heart and life. Get back where you need to be. Take on the uniform. Raise the flag. Move forward. If you're here without Christ today, this, this may seem very strange. You don't understand this whole context of the spiritual life, spiritual world, spiritual battle. But I want you to know, just because you don't fully understand it doesn't mean you're not in the heart of it and the heat of it. Satan would drag you to hell with great glee if you give him the opportunity. You have to make a stand somewhere. Say, I, I'm not going to follow the world anymore. I'm not going to follow my sin anymore. I'm not going to follow myself anymore. And sing that old anthem song, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. If you want to give your life to Christ today, you can do so. It starts with a heart 
Surrendering to Jesus as your Lord and Savior, trusting him, ask him to wash you and cleanse you and forgive you. He will do that very thing today in this moment. Open your heart to him. For Christians who find yourself not being in this description of faithfulness, I pray in the name of Jesus that you'll let God speak to your deepest, deepest heart of hearts and soul today and respond to what he's saying to you. You'll find forgiveness. You'll find anointing. You'll find the unction to function by responding to that. Would you stand with your heads bowed?